Hello, and welcome to a special bonus episode of Intrigue Explained. James, also known as Spaghetti Kozak, is an American who has spent months fighting as part of the Ukrainian Armed Forces and is about to return to Ukraine to continue the fight. He's also one of the most articulate and passionate voices in support of Ukraine, as well as one of the most researched. This week, he and I sat down for a long range of discussion about the war, social media, popular culture, Warhammer 40,000 at times, and just about anything else that popped into our heads. Thank you for having me on. And uh, so I'm, I'm an American citizen. Uh, I have been serving in the armed forces of Ukraine uh, for about a year now. Uh, I am currently in the States, uh, but I will be returning to frontline duties probably, uh, hopefully from this time in a few weeks. Before this, I was a journalist, uh, not a particularly successful one. And before that, I was an English teacher for many years. I lived abroad, uh, ironically, most of the time in Russia. And there's nothing that will teach you more about Russia and the problems with it and why you should fight against it than living in Russia and you know speaking the language and the, familiar, the familiarity uh, with the uh, with the country. I wanted to begin, James, by just asking you. You know, a lot of us are effectively watching this war play out via social media, via the official channels, a lot of unofficial channels. And the fog of war is dense. And of course, none of us really understand what it's like on the ground. So I wanted to begin by just, just asking you, what are a couple of things that you think people don't realize? Well, I would say, uh, because I, you know, when you look online, uh, you know, I'm not really in an echo chamber online. I tend to just use Twitter and while it's important to curate your timeline, of course, the thing is there's so much Russian disinformation out there and there's so much trolling out there on Twitter now that you're going to be exposed to the other side, definitely. And uh, what I see, though, is I see misconceptions on our side, uh, so to speak, where people start to watch this war like it's some kind of uh, football match or something. Mm -hmm. And they don't really understand the nature of it. So just like, for example, recently there was some, uh, some pics came out of some damage. It looks like they're not completely write-offs, but uh, you know, damage immobilized leopard tanks, uh, Bradley vehicles disabled. Uh, basically, you know, the Russians are going wild about it. Uh, and it's funny, everyone is looking at these two pictures and they're not looking at the bigger picture, which is what kind of gains the Ukrainian armed forces were making in that same area of operations within about 48 hours. Um, and, and the thing is like, you have to explain to some, some people who are just diehard fans and I hate to call them fans because again, this is not a football match. Uh, they watch this and when they see any evidence of Ukrainian losses, you know, they, they panic. Uh, they, they pull a, you know, Yulian Ropka, basically. If, uh, <laughs> I should probably explain who that is. <laughs> it's one of our favorite uh, Twitter main characters of the Ukraine war. Um, he's basically a uh, Doomer German, uh, ger uh, I'm using air quotes here, Build, journalist. Build, yes, build. Um, and, uh, but but it just, it describes the attitude some people have where, you know, when Ukraine was, was winning, for example, um, but for context, this is the journalist who, uh, when the counteroffensive started last year, which ended up retaking a huge swathe of Russian occupied territory, on something like within the first two hours, he tweeted out a photo of several disabled armored vehicles and declared the entire offensive a failure. Indeed. Uh, in fact, that was the, the Kherson counteroffensive that he was mm -hmm. basically doing the uh, last rites on. Uh, and before that, the Kharkiv counteroffensive was already like wildly successful. And I was a participant in that. And uh, so he had just kind of ignored that and saw that this other offensive had taken casualties. And apparently in war, if you take any casualties or you lose any vehicles, then it's done. Like you should just you should just basically pack well, it well, in. Well, you don't get the flawless achievement, right? And right, right, because, well, that's the thing, thing is that you, you can't fight reptile unless you get a double flawless and you have to end it with the fatality. 
Otherwise, you got to do it when, when you see Santa Claus go in front of the moon on the pit stage. But if you don't get that double flawless, if you even block one time, you don't get to fight Reptile. So what I'm saying is that Ukraine is going to win the war. I have complete faith in that. But uh, we're, we're not going to get to fight the secret character uh, Reptile. So uh, it's like when, it's like Ukraine's not even trying to get any of the speed runs done. That's well, yeah, they're not a completionist. You know, they're not going after all mm. the achievements. And some people just don't really approve of that play style. Um, you know, I'm just kind of a you know get through the whole game thing. But but honestly, like you know, we're joking here. But some people are kind of treating this as though it's either a video game or uh, actually when we say video game. I just severely dated myself with all those original Mortal Kombat references, but but people are seeing it like a, either a sporting event or a video game, and when they see stuff like that, I mean, I could tell you stuff that I saw. If, if, I, I could just, if I were to sort of edit my own experience at the front and only give you that information it, it, things would look absolutely awful and you would think how are they beating uh, the you know the russian army like this but that's because you're looking at certain aspects of it and you're not seeing the big picture and uh you know when you look at the big picture i mean the thing is when, when you saw the russians uh, and, and their their simps online uh, basically celebrating the capture of bakhmut because you know in war it's like Battlefield 4. It's like a video game where if you like get your guys on every objective point for a right amount of time, then you win the match and you have that city. It doesn't matter if your flanks are crumbling or if you lost tens of thousands of guys just to get there. All that matters is you got some guys on the capture point, right? And But it's not even it's not like they've taken all of the capture points. Even in your obviously satirical analogy. Yeah. They've taken one minor, if this were, I don't know, Dawn of War 2, they'd have captured like one point while the, losing all of the rest. Yeah, well, in the case of Bakhmut, I just, I just find it funny because it's like they're celebrating basically taking like the last street that is in the administrative borders of Bakhmut, this tiny town in eastern Ukraine. And I know it's tiny. I've been there before. And... Uh, it's funny because it's like, why are you even here? You were supposed to be the second greatest army in the world. Uh, Russia's own state media and all their simps in the West insisted that not only could Russia, Russia was supposed to just steamroll Ukraine. You saw these people online repeatedly saying things like either the Ukrainians are not even going to fight or they're just going to be utterly wiped out within the first hours of the war. We had... Uh, I know at least two accounts, and I say people save screenshots of these guys. One of them said the Ukrainian army just, he said, I don't know what to tell you. The Ukrainian military just seems to have uh, uh, shattered on impact. And uh, th this is literally within, like, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. this is day one. Yeah, and, and I have to say, like, I mean, I remember watching, watching the war or the lead up to the war unfold. And based on the things that I was reading, which turned out to be laughably false, my expectation was something like, the Russian Air Force denies the Ukrainian military the ability to maneuver and respond properly, hammers them into the ground. The Russians end up taking initially a lot of territory, including possibly Kiev, and then they just completely fail to hold it in the face of sustained resistance by a combination of the AFU and partisans. That that was honestly, like, I have to, and I don't, I think anybody who's familiar with my content would ever accuse me of being a simp for Russia. But based on the kind of analysis I was reading, that seemed, I didn't think Russia was going to win, but my expectation was that they would perform better initially in terms of taking territory than they did. Definitely a realistic assumption based on uh, the numbers, uh, if you compared like long range artillery and, and air support and stuff like that. And, and yeah, I'd say I'd agree with something like that where it would have been major gains at first and it would crumble in the face of basically a rising insurgency because a lot of the, what I would expect is a lot of the Ukrainian armed forces would basically sort of go underground taking all these weapons. And so you'd have all these grenades and stuff hidden in houses and everything. And how the hell do you fight against an insurgency, all of the members of which look exactly like you, most of which speak your language basically without an accent, and a good proportion of which have a lot of military experience and training because you have been terrorizing them in the east of their country for eight years at this point. Yeah, and, and I just wanted to go on to say that, um, you know, because I kind of got sidetracked a little bit earlier, but 
the the simps who were cheering on the Russian military, many of them insisted that not only could Russia's military easily sweep Ukraine, but they could take on NATO and even the U.S. And these people, you know, they talked about the they, them, woke army in, in the West. And, you know, look at the super hyper masculine uh, Russian army recruitment ad. Look at this guy with his shaved chest and chiseled abs and strong rock hard pecs. Like, this is a, a real army, not your western effeminate woke army and, and, and you know they're insisting this and and look where we are now we're over a year in this war and the most they can celebrate is taking a street in bakhmut um so why are we even here you know what i mean and that's something i want to remind even the people on our side is like yeah when you see these pictures of course they're going to be highly publicized um, you know, you see a leopard tank destroyed or something like that. This is destroyed by mines, okay? And the thing about mines, uh, I have a friend who was um, a good friend who was medically retired from the uh, the Marine Corps uh, because his uh, M1 Abrams tank was blown up uh, by an IED. And he pointed out, I mean, the, the M1A2 Abrams is, uh, you know, incredibly survivable vehicle. He survived it, obviously. Um, it is, uh, I think we, we didn't lose a single one to enemy fire in the first Gulf War, which is kind of where it had its combat debut. Uh, absolutely wonderful tank. But what he pointed out, he said, you put enough high explosives into something and you detonate under a tank, you're going to knock it out. He said, my Abrams was taken out by a high explosive load. It was high explosive loaded into a vegetable oil container, you know? And so th this kind of stuff is going to happen. And uh, when people panic so quickly seeing this, I think, you know, you're, you're acting too much like a sports spectator, like a fan. You know, we got to stop that. Would it be fair to say that during the you mentioned uh, the, the, there was the Kherson offensive, there was the offensive to push the Russian occupiers back from Kharkiv. It felt like especially with the with the Kharkiv offensive, the Russians really weren't at all prepared for the idea that the Ukrainians could counterattack in force. It, and so uh, are some of the expectations now being shaped by the rapid success of that offensive, whereas kind of right now the Ukrainians have to punch through positions the Russians have been building nonstop for six months? Yeah, that is a good point. They have definitely prepared a proper defensive line um, you know, how strong defenses are and how evenly distributed all this is, is, uh, you know, a matter beyond my, uh, my knowledge at the moment. Uh, but there is a, a definite difference between, uh, you know, the defenses that they had in Kharkiv Oblast, let's say last year and what they have now in the South of the country. And in fact, we saw that it was later last year that they started building a lot of these defensive lines with the anti-tank ditches and the dragon teeth and everything like that. Um, so <clears throat> so there is a, a difference there. But one thing uh, that's interesting about last year is that I remember in the time when I was with my first unit there, as we were sort of standing that unit up and training and everything, is that we were being told we were probably going south to Kherson, and everybody was kind of expecting Kherson to be the first counteroffensive because Kherson is the only oblast capital that Russia has managed to take in this war. Um, if you don't count Severodonetsk, which was a provisional capital for Luhansk because Luhansk was occupied. Uh, but it's, you know, it's Kherson and it was a city they, they, the first major city they took, basically, they took uh, very early in the war because Kherson Oblast is extremely difficult to defend. It's just flat, you know, it's open flat land. I mean, even where I operate out in, you know, Kharkiv Oblast in that area, you at least have some rolling hills, you have ravines and stuff like that. Uh, so Kherson fell and then there was a lot of, uh, you know, they were trying to go past Kherson, right? They had to go through Mikolaev to get to Odessa. And of course, they were basically stopped pretty cold around Mikolaev. And uh, there was counterattacks at the time. There was movement towards Kherson and it just seemed to us that we're going to get sent to Kherson. Sure enough, we were sent south and we actually deployed. We were sent south. We were sent to Kherson Oblast. Uh, our, my first operation was in Kherson Oblast, um, not near the city, but in the eastern part of the oblast. 
And uh, we were led to believe that we were basically part of like sort of a pincher uh, coming down from the north. Um, and then we assumed that, you know, they'd have the uh, Western pincher there driving directly on Harrison. Uh, but what happened was after, you know, a uh, few days at the front, we, uh, we cleared one village. We were supposed to go village to village until we got to this uh, particular city. And uh, but then we were pulled off the front and then nothing really happened in that direction until um, it started happening in late summer. But even then, the actual push on Harrison came after the Kharkiv counteroffensive. I heard a rumor about the Kharkiv counteroffensive in July, and I sort of dismissed it because it seemed odd to me. It seemed all the momentum is going towards Kherson. Kherson seems to be the priority. And uh, what is more is I didn't believe they would have the capability to, uh, to do such a large offensive, an operational offensive on two axes, two different parts of the country, All right? And because uh, you got to remember this time, like we still didn't have a lot of high Mars systems. Um, we didn't have any of these tanks or anything like that. Uh, I don't even think we had stuff like the harm missiles or you know, anything like the, the anti-radiation missiles. So, um, you know, what was accomplished uh, last September and last October in the South was done without a lot of the equipment that we've been talking about since then. Um, and it was so, you know, in a, in a way, like the, the Harkiv counteroffensive was kind of um, unexpected uh, by myself, um, but also unexpected by the Russians. And what's interesting is that I was privy to, at least, you know, with the, the unit I work with, I was privy to the planning. We actually um, discussed uh, their defensive positions a lot and, uh, you know, we're basically uh, tailoring our plan and everything and there's kind of an assumption that they must know that this is coming they can't not be aware of this just because of the size of units involved and everything um turns out we were wrong uh, they were basically caught unawares and you see a lot of reports and anecdotes about how they just basically ran and in that those initial days um our, just our tiny team alone uh, captured a lot of gear uh you know rpgs rpos tnt uh a lot of the ieds we've made since then is, is, is we make them using tnt that we captured from the russians i mean why use your own stuff right <laughs> so uh yeah grenades rifles just all kinds of stuff were just left behind actually everything up to vehicles were left behind there was a, a lot of video of uh tanks just left on the side of the road because they ran out of fuel um, many of those tanks have been impressed into the uh, into the Ukrainian armed forces now. Uh, so yeah, that's a situation where I think they weren't expecting it, and I think the Ukrainians put them off balance by telegraphing uh, so much in the south and then hitting them with mm -hmm. that that jab in Kharkiv and then going into Kherson. And what's interesting about it is this is what I told people in a video about the counteroffensive. I uh, I was predicting the counteroffensive would be later and sooner. Now, some people may say that was um, inaccurate now uh, because it seems that the counteroffensive is underway. But it's like, where do you draw the line, really? I mean, this I, I would still say what's going on is probably probing uh, actions to see which... Gen General Hodges has, a, has an article, I think, where he says, listen, guys, it's not, it's not really the counteroffensive until you see the heavy brigades deploy where you see hundreds of armored vehicles in pushes and that this is still probing. So it sounds like sort of that's the sort of thing you're thinking about. Yeah, and, and that fits with Zaluzhny's strategy in general is, you know, find the weak spots and then go through there. And uh, so, you know, if you want to say I'm wrong and the counteroffense has definitely begun, fine. But the issue is that what, what I was saying at the time, as I said, what you're probably going to see is I, I, I kind of had this like magical thinking. I said, what they're going to do is they're going to hold off until all the Russian simps are screaming online, laughing about how, where's this, <laughs> where's this vaunted counteroffensive you promised? Because that's exactly what they did last year. They said, where's your Harrison counteroffensive? You said that June they'd be in Harrison, July they'd be in Harrison, August. And then, of course, you know, what happens, they lose all of Kharkiv Oblast and, uh, you know, and then Arizona is liberated, right? So I said, it's probably, and, you know, maybe if this is what Hodges is expecting, is these large 
uh, brigade level maneuvers. Uh, all you have to do is don't, don't don't look at pictures of tanks or anything like that. Just look at the critical mass of Russia simps laughing about how the counteroffensive isn't coming, <laughs> how it's completely defeated and destroyed, and Kiev is going to fall when when Russia takes its real army out out from behind the Ural Mountains and deploys it. And once they get to that critical mass, when they reach that amount of hope. Okay, that's when Zeluzhny will just shatter all their hope. You know what this is actually similar to, and it's very appropriate. If it turns out that opium is flammable, once it reaches enough density in the air, you can just ignite it. Right. Actually, I was going to compare it to uh, I was going to compare it to a 40k reference because you know the uh, a feature of the orcs, and this is very appropriate. A feature of the orcs in 40k is that they have the ability to create a sort of magical field where if enough of them believe that a hunk of junk will fly through space, it will. And if they, if they believe they can smash a bunch of machine parts into something and it becomes a tank that works, it will be a tank. And this is basically a way the, uh, the writers hand wave away the idea that you know, these, this dumbass... Any of their technology at all works. Yeah, yeah, but basically, you know, because they're, they're, they're basically a bunch of, of dumbass thugs. And the only way that you can explain is, like, why do they have jets? Well, because they all believe that when they put this together, it will work. I should explain, we are talking about the fictional universe Warhammer 40,000, even if the parallels to the Russian military, watching whom you sometimes go, how do these guys have jets, uh, are uncanny. Well, to see, that's the thing, is that, see, the fictional orcs, when they all believe it works, when they have that hopium, it works. When the real orcs have that belief in hopium, it still doesn't work. So it's just, it's like... Uh... Well, you know, on, on, on that score of, like, Russian belief, I mean, I am I am weak, so I sometimes have flashes of empathy, I guess, because I'm, like, human. And one of the sort of genuinely heartbreaking things is uh, Ukrainian intelligence releases this from time to time, war translated releases it from time to time, is it'll be a recording from some Russian unit or sometimes like their wives and mothers back home. And they are, you know, they've been left in a field. Their commanders run off. They haven't been resupplied in four weeks. Their MREs expired in 1991. And, but like the message is, if only the great chief, if only Vladimir Putin knew, or like, I am going to write to the military commissariat and they will fix it. And like, for me, that almost like childlike hope or belief that Putin gives a damn or that the, that all of this isn't kind of this corruption isn't by design and that this incompetence isn't baked in, that just like something's gone wrong and someone hasn't been told the king must be, must be being misinformed by his advisors is honestly like a little bit heartbreaking. Even even though sort of don't have a lot of sympathy for Russian soldiers, given the last well, really all of history. But look, it, it is there's something kind of slightly heartbreaking about it to me because they genuinely believe what you speak to there is. Uh, this is something the phrase is "good czar, bad boyar." So, for people who are not too familiar with Russian history, boyars uh, basically a term for the nobility. And basically the idea is that the Tsar is always good. He's always good. He's wise. He's a good leader. He's the only person qualified to lead Russia. Anyone else is too weak and Russia will fall. The empire will fall. Uh, but there are uh, simultaneously, while Russia is this great unique civilization and the true bearer of European values that the European liberal degenerates have thrown away, uh, this is something but they really believe for. Being historically Francophiles, yeah, who, who <laughs> wait to copy as much of French culture as they yeah. possibly can. But it, the thing is, that this belief has been around in Russia for at least over a century. You know, like Dostoevsky mm -hmm. was a, a part of this Slavophilic, uh, you know, ideology. But uh, so the idea is is that uh, you know the Tsar is wise; he's necessary to keep everything. Uh, you know, running and, and Russia is this great civilization and this great empire, but it is also hopelessly corrupt and it has, it's full of powerful corrupt people who are not accountable. And these people are out there running their schemes 
oppressing people. And the Tsar is not informed about this. He doesn't know about it. There must be some mistake. So an early example of this would be the, uh, the Bloody Sunday incident. Um, and, and this was sort of an appeal. It started with just sort of an appeal to the Tsar about how the workers are exploited and abused. And, you know, it wasn't, what, it wasn't like a revolution. It wasn't against the system or the monarchy, it was against this idea that, you know, these, these capitalists in the country are, uh, they, they don't care about the health of the empire, and they are exploiting and, you know, scheming and stuff like this. And so this, this trend would continue, for example, in the Stalin era. Uh, an interesting feature of Stalin era is that a lot of times, you know, we associate it with this paranoia and everyone is denouncing each other and everything. But what's interesting is that it is also associated with hundreds of thousands of people writing routinely writing letters to high level communist party officials, including Joseph Stalin himself, uh, basically appeals. Uh, sometimes they were complaining about administrators or local party bosses, factory people. Uh, they were complaining that a relative had been jailed. And of course, there, there must be some mistake, Comrade Stalin. My friend is a, you know, a dedicated Marxist-Leninist communist. He's a party member, you know. And there was all these um, letters and appeals that basically they, they had this idea that, uh, you know, it's not like, for, for example, before the, the Bolshevik Revolution, you know, they, it was the bad boyars, right, under the monarchy, the bad nobility. Under the early Soviet Union, the Stalin era, the it was spies and wreckers, you know, agents of Japan, agents of Italy, agents of Germany or something like that. And these could be anybody. Um, nobody, but, but they couldn't conceive that maybe these people in the Communist Party are just incompetent, right? And then after... Um, you know, uh, during the Yeltsin era, of course, the whole system was kind of seen as incompetent. I think, it, it, if anything, is um, if they had one like positive uh, moment, is that I, I think none of them thought that Yeltsin was a good czar who just didn't know what was going on. Uh, they they kind of all knew that he sucked. Uh, but with Putin, that's basically they they revived this. Is that they revived this idea? So much of Yeltsin's perception as incompetent versus Putin's perception as hyper-competent is a combination of, frankly, just vibes and optics. Like, Putin was better at managing his image than Yeltsin was, in part because Yeltsin was a drunk, but Putin very carefully stage-managed his image. And then the oil price shot up by, like, 400% or something silly, and so the checks went out. Literally, Putin was able to get people's pension checks out in a way that Yeltsin wasn't always able to. And those two things combined to kind of rebuild this image of Putin as the hyper-competent Tsar following the quote-unquote national humiliation of Yeltsin. Oh yeah, you know, it's always been funny to me how two camps in Russia, uh, oftentimes the opposition and the pro-Putin people, both want to try to sever Yeltsin from Putin. So the opposition will say, well, okay, Yeltsin had his problems, but he was different because we had a chance at democracy, which is funny because he kind of directly crushed it. And then, of course, Putin, on the other hand, his whole thing is like Yeltsin was a puppet of the West. He was part of our humiliation. And the Putin regime is setting things right. It's, you know, it... it, it change the the course of the state and everything and the funny thing is these two people are inseparably linked right like putin doesn't get into power without yeltsin yeltsin picks him because of the recommendation of the same oligarchs who would later turn you know turn into dissidents against putin and die um you know, putin was he was mainly picked because of his diehard loyalty to the corrupt gangster Anatoly uh, Sobchak in St. Petersburg. Uh, and then when Putin took power, like part of that deal was that Putin basically gave blanket pardons to Yeltsin and everyone in his family. And they never prosecuted anybody for any of that stuff during the 90s. And we're all supposed to just ignore this. And what's often funny also is that, you know, the like I said, there's that dual narrative and, you know, you called it vibes. Uh, the vibes of Yeltsin being this American puppet 
what strings were on Yeltsin? We just kept dumping money on this guy. The money is getting squandered. Western investors were getting screwed out of their investment because, uh, you know, their partners in Russia were basically corrupt. And uh, the whole time, Yeltsin is engaging in military uh, aggression in Moldova and Georgia, making threats to Ukraine, like the same things that Russia would later do to Ukraine in 2014. The Yeltsin government was making these same threats about Donbass and Crimea until the late 90s. And wh where is this humiliation? I mean, the U.S. went and pressured Belarus, Kazakhstan, and Ukraine, of course, to give up their nukes and strategic weapons and actually give them to Russia in exchange for these worthless security guarantees. All of this allowed Russia to basically gradually absorb uh, Belarus. It allowed them to get their hooks further into Ukraine. Uh, where's the humiliation? If anything, I mean, they but, were just... I mean, the humiliation was, was vibes. It was the sense that Yeltsin is this, like, slightly silly drunk who stumbles off airplanes and the world is laughing at him but somehow that kind of filter completely switched off everybody's laughing pretty hard at putin and has been for quite some time i mean they're certainly laughing now it's sort of th this notion that like you you freeze frame one moment in history and go this was humiliating and look you can tell it was humiliating because people made jokes about it and then you stop applying that critical filter ever again. Yes, and you know this gets into some of the stuff we often hear about NATO expansion or this uh, this idea you hear a lot about in American foreign policy about who lost Russia. We lost Russia, and so you'll have people who are uh, have been pretty consistently anti-Putin and are at least superficially pro-Ukraine, pro-democracy and everything. But at the same time, they communicate this idea that we lost Russia. Somehow there was a misunderstanding. Uh, we did something, maybe we were arrogant. Uh, this is kind of the, like uh, the Obama administration idea that we were arrogant and it offended the Russians and we didn't take them seriously. And, and you know, it became a big misunderstanding. You know, it's like a, a rom-com, right, where you know, somebody overheard, they overheard the U.S. speaking on the phone about, yeah, Russia, don't worry about that country, right? And they didn't get the context and they just walked out in a huff. And then we got to spend the third act uh, building to the, the great gesture that America will do to win Russia back, right? Like when we, we follow... Perhaps, perhaps a reset button with the wrong word written on it. Yeah, exactly. The, the, the reset was like the equivalent of, you know, Russia's going to the airport and we're running through airport security, ignoring the TSA to profess our love to Russia. Um, right, and, and it you know, starts that, that reset, the reset that comes right after they attack Georgia. And... Uh, and what did that get us? You know, what did the, the, the whole time they just decided more and more that uh, that we're the enemy. And we're still, you know, we got Biden, uh, we got the U.S. mission to the OSCE just yesterday tweeting about how we're we're not the enemy or you're not our enemy. It's like, well, they think you are, you know, I mean, we we could say we're not ISIS's enemy, but I, ISIS is pretty sure we're a bunch of unbelievers that need to die or convert. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's this, um, this lack of understanding. And, you know, on the subject of arrogance, it's also a profoundly arrogant way of looking at the world that if, if the U S state department had just calibrated the messaging a little bit differently, if there had been a slightly different, you know, if we, if there had been a summit that had different optics, that the U S could somehow fundamentally change the course of russian history and russian foreign policy and make these people not who they demonstratively are they keep showing us who they are and we keep looking at it going oh no what did we do to make them this way like we didn't make them this way they're all 60 they've been this way since they were 20 it wasn't something you did in yeah exactly um you know one aspect of this uh that, that i find funny is this, it's it's a lack of cultural understanding and the clues are all there laid out in the open if you really listen to them and for example one theme that putin has repeated multiple times is when he talks about nato and the partnership 
they talk about how our Western partners, you know, we, we tried to work to them, we tried to reach an agreement, and they played us. They tricked us. And this goes back to this thing about how, you know, they promised that NATO wouldn't expand, but it expanded, and they threatened us, and they kept expanding. And they keep using this term, they tricked us. Because in the dominant Russian culture, mainstream Russian culture, is very much influenced by organized crime and the gulag, prison culture, right? And it is a culture where if you negotiate with people in good faith, uh, you are weak. You're a cuck, right? Um, the idea is, you know, these people, their idea is that the U.S. and Russia are naturally rivals, okay? Geopolitics dominates the thinking there, geographical determination. They have this idea there that uh, a land empire, and of course Russia must be an empire, otherwise there's no Russia, so a land empire must necessarily get into fights with a sea empire. In the past, this would be the the British. Uh, you know, we all know about the great game in the 19th century and the rivalry between uh, Russia and the UK, which of course led to uh, the disastrous Crimean War. It's the reason why they um, ended up selling Alaska to the United States. And uh, so, they, you know, there's this long belief that uh, they have to be in conflict with this imperial rival. And of course, the, uh, the sea power of, you know, the post-World War II era is the U.S. So they believe that this is just the way the world works. So the idea that they should negotiate in good faith with the U.S. and give any kind of concession whatsoever is basically a cuck move. Right. Like they don't see negotiations the same way as we 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 see it as, um, you know, we have different self-interested parties and we do have conflicts, but there are things we both want. And if we're willing to trade one thing, we'll get another thing. OK. And sometimes, unfortunately, that approach will lead to countries like the U.S. making bargains with regimes that we shouldn't. Right. But in the case of Russia, it is ridiculous because. We had this idea that, okay, we will accommodate them in some of their concerns, and surely they will do the same for us. And they don't. And I'll tell you this, look at every Western Russia simp. And I say, you know, go back to 2014. Everyone that did this sort of like concern trolling act about mm -hmm. how we need to meet Russia halfway, we should listen to Russia and everything. Uh, we need to negotiate. We need to meet them halfway. Sit down at the table. You know, they just want to. They just want to seat at the table and to be treated like adults and with respect. And what you will see is a long list of concessions that we need to make, and nothing that they need to concede. Nothing like pull all their troops out of Ukraine. I'm talking pre 2022. Uh, absolutely nothing like that. They concede nothing. We concede everything, and then what are we supposed to get out of this? Some vague cooperation on nuclear issues or something like that. It's an assumption, I think, that Russians will value norms for norms' sake and abide by norms and rules that aren't kinetically enforced, because like us, they believe that the benefits of these kind of frameworks, of norms, of predictability, outweigh the short-term gains you can get by flouting them. But that's not the Russian approach at all. They come from it from a position of strength and consequences. They look at it, you show them a rule, and their first question is, where is it written, I cannot do this thing I want to do? And if you say, well, actually, it's written right here, they look at that and go, okay, but... If I do it anyway, what happens? And in a lot of cases in the West, we sort of say, well, nothing but you damage the system or your reputation will be trashed or we will complain about it. And they're like, oh, okay, well, that, that seems like a reasonable exchange because I get that thing I want. And I'm pretty sure you'll be back here in six months talk, trying to pull me back into the fold and trying to lure me back into being a member of these norms and systems and offering me more things to do it. So I'm going to get what I want now, and I'm going to get whatever bribe you will offer me six months, 12 months, 18 months from now in an effort to reset, as you were saying. Yeah, it's it's very much like uh, a spoiled child. And, and yeah, when you talk about norms, for example, uh, their idea is that rules are for suckers. If, if you're a weakling, I'm sorry, <clears throat> 
If you're a weakling, you need to follow rules. If you're, you know, a, a dignified, uh, you know, respectable person, you don't follow rules. And that's the thing. It's an authoritarian system, and power is kind of, uh, power is emphasized, obviously, as the most important thing. Uh, and power is demonstrated by your ability to not uh, follow the rules. To not be, and, and by the by way, that. this isn't like this sounds like we're sort of just opining on a culture and we're making stuff up. Talk to any Russian about their three tiered system of justice. There is a system of justice for ordinary people, there is a system of justice for oligarchs and the rich, and there is a system of justice for siloviki, the sort of force organs, the intelligence community. And it is absolutely understood by everyone that the system will overtly treat you in completely different categories and the further you are up that sort of tree the more the stronger the krisha the sort of the high person in the system that's running cover for you the more you can effectively flout the rules exactly and in fact you know at this point it's it's also good to emphasize uh, I, I think westerners this is part of that uh, big misunderstanding is that um, we tend to have, you know, because of our system, like in the U S you know, we have the constitution, it's supposed to be about equal rights. So there's a strong emphasis on fairness, right? And we all want to be fair. We all want, especially, uh, again, especially Americans, because we're removed from Europe. A lot of Americans don't really know the history here. So we want to be the sort of objective observer. And there are certainly advantages to that at times, but sometimes, you know, it, it's, you're objective because you're ignorant, you know what I mean? And so when we talk about these beliefs and these cultural things in Russia, this is not some kind of unfair smear towards Russia. Many Russians will tell you this. Um, I saw this in person. This kind of thing was pretty much explained to me by Russians. So that's where this comes from. It's not just us two, uh, you know, evil Russophobes here just smearing the entire country this is and that's why i keep i keep saying this is the mainstream culture i'm not saying that every individual russian uh adheres to this or believes in this uh but this is what well, dominates although, although yeah. on that i swear to god i beg you i beg you western journalists western students do not go to moscow spend six months doing coke and getting blowjobs in moscow nightclubs or drinking coffee in like ultra liberal super trendy cafes and then come back to the west talking about how you understand the soul of the russian people like i'm just i'm pleading with you it's like going to uc berkeley attending one feminist intersectionality class and then deciding that you understand all of america <laughs> yes, uh, you are now an expert on America yeah. and women because the class. Yeah, and, uh, I find that really funny because um, you know my experience in Russia was uh, at a time when it was uh, Moscow was one of the most expensive cities in the world to live in at the time, and I was poor. I came there with like sixty bucks to my name, and so. For me, being in like a mid-range restaurant once a week initially was like, you know, this great thing. And, uh, and maybe that's why I had a bit of a better educational experience because I had to live that uh, that, that lifestyle for, for most of the time and, you know, didn't get the... Uh, didn't get the the clubbing experience or anything like that. Uh, no cocaine, just mostly beer and vodka. And... Um, and, and, and yeah, what you're saying is exactly true. I think we have a lot of uh, diplomats and Russia experts and think tank people where their experience in Russia is like some kind of fellowship, you know, some sort of like, um, uh, you know, temporary job, six to, you know, maybe six months to a year or something, maybe a summer trip in Moscow or St. Petersburg, or maybe, you know, they would make some regular trips to Moscow and do some lecturing or something like that, do some research. And, uh, and, and they think that they, they understand the, uh, the country, you know, and it's, it's, it's funny where, um, you know, a lot of these people have, uh, you know, advanced postgraduate degrees, um, and they have collectively off and on spent a lot of time in Russia, but mostly in, in Moscow. Um, 
And it's funny, like I'm a guy who never went to college and people from the region, uh, especially from Ukraine, will tell you that I get Russia a lot better than a lot of these experts. You know, and that's not to brag, but I, like my to my defense, just look at what's happening now. You know, look what's happened in the mm. last eight years. Look at what's happening now. Who's been right? Who's been disproven? Because the thing is, all this international relations theory that's been dominating uh for example the american foreign policy establishment uh for you know all these years uh their recommendations on dealing with russia and everything what are the results of that where are their results where's their stable prosperous democratic russia working hand in hand with europe it's not there what we have is the fourth reich basically uh committing genocide yet again um so I don't know. I'd throw out those books. I'd ask my university for a refund, if, if possible, because clearly it didn't work. Clearly, we would have been better served had we listened to the opinions of Lithuanian taxi drivers than these foreign policy experts with their recommendations about how to deal with Russia and, and how we lost Russia and we have to, like, find common ground, right? What's that meme that's going around Twitter that like Midwestern wine mums have been right on every major issue yes. for about a decade and a half? Yes. And if we just like listened. <laughs> yes. And that's the thing is I remember, you know, I remember in the early Trump era, like, yeah, the the thing is that the wine moms talking about Russia Gate all the time and they, they, their, <laughs> their problem was uh, they were cringe, right? They may have been cringe, right. but they were right. And that's what matters, right, is being uh, right. It doesn't matter how you, you know, this is kind of a thing you can say about like NAFO and, and uh, some of the pro-Ukrainian people online is like, there's a lot of stuff in that old movement that may be cringe, but they're on the right side, you know. And uh, and that's what, and another thing is that cringe shit posting uh, has a quality of all of its own. Sometimes, if you're fighting propaganda, cringe shit posting in response to it is in some cases more effective. Also, and I think this comes down to you know th there was a really trenchant critique of South Park libertarianism that I think translates over to anti cringeness, which is there is a way of saying that basically cringe is earnestness a lot of the time. A lot of the things that get labeled as cringe is just someone being really earnest in an opinion when we are all supposed to be kind of seven layers of irony, seven layers of cynicism removed. And, you know, something like a absolutely brutal invasion is something that it is worth being earnestly upset about. Like it is, it is, you know, it, it's, it's okay to be moved by the videos that the Ukrainian Ministry of Defense put out that are like 120% earnest. But like, yeah, it's incredibly moving that people are putting their lives on the line, like yourselves, to defend strangers from a brutal fate. Like, I don't, I don't think we should be apologizing for that. And I don't think we should be letting hipsters in Brooklyn who think they're too cool for any legitimate feeling apart from the vague notion that they want to bring down capitalism define what we what we're proud of yeah um that's a really good way of putting it actually you know i kind of uh started rolling my eyes at south park many years ago just because of this uh their inability to actually do effective political satire because they just don't understand the issues they're trying to satirize and this, you know, this had an effect on a whole generation, I think, politically, both left and right, to the point where everything is about, for example, making your opponents mad and showing how you're not mad. You know, it's like the drill tweet, like, yeah. I'm not mad. Make sure you write in your newspaper, I'm not mad. Yeah. And and like you said, there are things that you, first, okay, first of all, everybody's angry about something okay everybody who says i'm triggering the libs has a thing that they easily get triggered by like i would say the more someone goes out of their way to try to offend people and be edgy the easier it is to identify the innocuous thing that you can trigger that person with right i see this on online uh all the time but like you said, which, by the way, is why half those accounts are anonymous and give no details about themselves so that they can kind of shield 
what makes them angry. Oh yeah, but you know, I'm I'm a Twitter veteran. I will find it. I will dig through the layers. <laughs> I will find that thing that makes them upset, and I will harp on that until they are a smoking crater <laughs> in the ground. But the thing is that, but it's, thank you for your service. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's like you said. There are things you should be outraged about. And there are things you should yeah. get that that's that's human. That's being normal. That's the thing is there's this idea about you know, the it's not even when you talk about the Brooklyn podcasters and all this and these irony poison people, it's all about being ironic and showing like how you don't really care. And this is kind of their fallback every time, you know, when you look at the, uh, you know, some of these podcasters, I'm not going to name them by name, but I think we all know who they are, but like they will get passionate about stuff. They support political candidates and they try to espouse political beliefs, but anytime they get questioned or they get, challenge they just fall back on that irony and they just fall back on the the memes the straw men of their opponents and everything and if you do that you're not really serious about your politics you have to be sincere even if it means you might sound cringe to somebody and i will add to that that you know it's really funny how one of the worst places on the internet and probably a bane of mankind is 4chan and all the chan boards but there is a very every once in a while every once in a while there is a gem of wisdom that will drop from someone on there and one of them was this one i think it came out about a few months into the large-scale war going on where someone said be honest with yourself. You could, okay, first of all, a lot of you know a lot of these chuds are supporting Russia, right? This guy drops in there. He might be a chud himself, but he's an honest chud because he comes in there and he says, "Be honest. The reason you support Russia isn't because you know anything about it, or you believe in what they believe, or you really support what they're trying to do in Ukraine, or anything like that. It's because you saw people you consider normies standing up for Ukraine." And you don't want to be a normie. And that's the worst thing to use to be a normie. So what you're going to do is you're going to uh, adopt this contrarian position. What I say to people, stop calling, stop dividing people into normies and whatever the hell you are. Uh, I like to use a term. You know, what, you know what another term for normie is? It's more accurate. Functioning adult. Okay. <laughs> These are people that have romantic relationships. They have good or decent jobs with career prospects they own property of some kind they have fun and they have social lives they don't spend all their time as a shut-in on twitter they're even better off than me you know i, I would like to be more normie if i could I mean. this this is my like grand uh pissing off your stepdad theory of politics where you just pick any issue that will make Travis, who's just trying to like make your mom happy and, and but occasionally tells you to maybe get a job, that you just pick any issue that you think will get him mad and that he doesn't support. Yeah, like, like, like he, he's so he's a good people. stepdad. He doesn't want to, you know, he doesn't want to get involved and, and, and interfere. He just wants you to sometimes maybe pick up after yourself because it's because he's getting shit from your mom about it, right? But you got to be like, you know, no, Travis, like, uh, yeah. you know, you're, stop. You, you CIA plant. Yeah, you CIA shill. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but but yeah, I mean, it, it really is this, uh, the, the edginess, the contrarianism. I, I think it's important to like step back and ask yourself, what are you really doing here? And that's a message for the young people. And I want to say, I'm not, you know, I'm not particularly a successful, uh, sorry, I'm not particularly successful in the sense that like, uh, you know, I don't own property. I don't own a home. I don't own a car. I don't even own a TV. I make YouTube videos that are either shit posts or video game reviews, usually of old video games people no longer care about. Um, and I ended up going off to, to fight in a war in another country that I'm not a citizen of. So I'm not going to say, you know, I'm not going to become the next, uh, you know, influencer talking about the path to success and the grind set that you need to do to, you know, the, the, the Ukrainian armed forces path to alpha male, whatever. Uh, but I'm just, do have a supplement you could buy though, guys, uh, the link will be at the link. It'll be at the bottom. You know it's why I survived of... the the front is because of the <laughs> uh, brain dick pills that I took every day that are made from uh, a special proprietary blend of eleven herbs and spices. Uh, so yeah, we'll definitely be hawking that at some point. No, this is this is actually um, 
you know, th this is something I do have to uh, think about in the future is we do need to create the Ukraine war vet bro culture. Uh, so <laughs> maybe I will start a collective after the war where we start making coffee companies and we start uh, marketing our products by playing on that American male insecurity that is such a money maker. And honestly, I feel like I've been leaving money on the table for years because I haven't got in on this game. So you once you figure it out and you can hawk a supplement or some kind of uh, system to, you know, to get women or whatever you are, uh, you know, you're, you're on easy street. Maybe, maybe I'll finally be able to afford a car, right? <laughs> Maybe the answer to countering countering Russian propaganda is just to like constantly repeat that supporting Ukraine gets you girls. It is well, first of all, it does okay. But the other thing is that uh, you know this is funny when you talk about countering propaganda. Um, I can say because I I've seen this from the inside and I've seen that you know in 2014 Western governments, especially the U.S., realized that oh no the Russians don't like us we we thought they did because of the reset and all the nice things we did for them but they don't like us and they they got this TV channel it's been around since 2005 and they're broadcasting propaganda to us and we need to counter it right and then of course after 2016 it only exploded and we're like oh we got to counter this Russian propaganda and the problem with that is that. Obviously, whatever efforts you have to counter the propaganda uh, needs money. You need funding, right? And uh, the people who hold the purse strings basically want two things. They want technical solutions. So like, you know, AI programs that will map out these Twitter bots and tell you how they're linked to the Internet Research Agency in St. Petersburg. Or they want fact checking because they're like, oh, well, you know, the Russians said we did this. Well, if we just made a fact check and made, wrote a long 2000 word article debunking every aspect of it, uh, then people will see that and they'll say, oh, the Russians are lying. Uh, and the thing is, neither of these things work too well. If you have the technical thing and you say, ah, all these all these answers you see here are bots linked to a Russian troll factory, then the people inclined to believe that are just going to be like, well, I bet the CIA has troll factories too. Uh, or, or they'll say something like, well, so the bots are boosting this, but what if it's true? And then when it comes to fact checking, like, forget about it. Like, I, it, thanks to the 4chan chuds and everything, the very idea of debunking something You'll see them mock this when someone says, like, this claim was debunked. You know, some claim of zero evidence is debunked. They'll be like, huh, source? It was debunked, you know? And it's like, do you do you need someone to explain to you what debunking and fact-checking means? But the thing is, that, that that's the thing, is facts do not matter. Narrative matters. You have to tell a better story. And one thing that Russia is very good at, and I see the far right is good at this in other countries as well, it's that they tell a story, and it's a story that ties in with your identity. So in the case of Russian propaganda, it's not necessarily what they're saying, what they say the facts are. It's what they surround it in. What is RT's motto? Question more. You're not a sheep who just sits there and listens to the mainstream media like all those cringe normies. You want the real story that... They won't tell you. It, it's it's packaged in all this. Or you know, it's like I say that the more a media company tells you that the mainstream media lies, and they tell you that you know we're the we're truth seekers. You're a truth seeker. We're truth tellers. You know, the more they talk about truth and call their other competitors lies, the more likely they are lying, right? Because if you're a legitimate media source, you don't need to tell people repeatedly we're telling the truth. The idea is that you should be demonstrating that not telling that right show don't tell um so i think it's yeah. um people want to feel like they are they have something to say that they are interesting they're not like everyone else they want to feel like they are a hero of their own story and here comes rt to say you've got the real truth and everyone else is a hypnotized sheeple as you were saying so for a lot of people who haven't taken the time to work on themselves and haven't taken the time to be engaging interesting people because they have thought about the world or they have created something or they are passionate about something in a constructive way that can bring other people along with them. And I know we decided we wouldn't talk too much about 40k in this one, but you know, how many people in our hobby are passionate about 40k in a way that pushes others away rather than brings them closer. 
But setting that aside, you know, they, they feel like they don't have anything else to offer. And so they cling to this idea of like, if I just listen to RT, I'll have the real truth. And what will make me interesting is that I'm not blinded the way these chuds are. That is a very good point, and it's something that I think we in the West, especially us Americans, uh, have this issue of what we call main character syndrome. And <laughs> you, uh, you explained it earlier as being a hero of your own story, and that's what we mean when we say main character syndrome. And I will say all of us Americans suffer from this. Uh, there is, as of yet, no treatment. There's no medication for it. All you can do is sort of have self-awareness. And I will give this is the best advice Young men, forget these grifters like Andrew Tate. This is the be best advice you're ever going to get. Understand you're not the hero of your own action thriller movie. And every time you get this feeling that you're, you, know, you start looking at yourself as this character or something like that, stop and, and think about, like, you know, how do I actually interact with other people? The, the story doesn't revolve around me. Trust me, it'll happen. If you really think about it, you'll find yourself thinking that way sometimes. And when you do, stop it. Please get help. But as you said, and I think you put it in a really good way, every, everybody, you know, when we go to some party, especially if you're kind of socially awkward, uh, yeah, we want to seem interesting. We want to have something to say. We want to have, uh, we want to sound sophisticated when people are speaking about politics. Uh, you know, like I, I live in the D.C. area. And uh, actually, to be honest, uh, I, I find most people in the D.C. area are typically discussing like sports and stuff like you think it's going to be nonstop talk about whether the congressman and legislation and everything. Maybe I'm just going to the wrong bars. But uh, but the thing is, yeah, yeah, you want to sound interesting. You want to have a take. And basically, any conspiracy theories, not just what Russia is selling, Russia does deliberately deliberately uh, promote conspiracy thinking, but any conspiracy thinking is designed to make you sound more exciting and interesting with none of the work. And I can give you an example, like after 9-11, you know, I had a lot of idiotic ideas about a lot of things, but one thing I understood about 9-11 is that I understood that Osama bin Laden is a guy who doesn't like the United States, and and they certainly pulled this off, and it was you know it seemed unprecedented, but I realized that I knew enough at the time to know that uh, they were able to pull it off because first of all they worked on the plan for years, but also there were certain vulnerabilities in the system that actually help them pull off that attack, right? And uh, so there were people going two ways in the early 2000s, right? Some people are going off in this conspiracy direction. And I remember I was just laughing at this stuff from the beginning. Somebody sent me an email link and it had a site called Hunt the Boeing. And it had a picture of the Pentagon uh, from the top where you could see the damage in the ring, the outer ring where the roof collapsed, where the plane initially hit. And they put the, they superimposed a silhouette of a Boeing plane in that wreckage. And they said, where's the Boeing? And I'm like, you expected to find anything resembling a plane in that part of the building when it hit at high speed? Why would you even think that? Planes aren't super collision resilient because they have to be light enough to fly. Yeah, it's like they were expecting uh, like a Looney Tunes style cutout of an airplane cleanly like in the, the tail sticking the out of the right, right. back or something. Yeah, and, and yeah. so so that already kind of turned me off to the rising, uh, you know, 9-11 trutherism. But in, in my mind, is like, well, I want to understand where these guys came from and uh, and what they believed. And so I started reading, I, I won't say they were the best sources. I was reading stuff from a former CIA officer who worked on this, this issue. Uh, this stuff was, you know, very popular in bookstores at the time. Uh, but, you know, I read back to the, the story of like Abdullah Azam and the so-called Arab Afghans and the, what was called the MAC. Uh, the, basically, it's a acronym for Services Bureau. And that later evolved into what would become Al Qaeda. And, and so... You know, I, I, I felt a sort of confidence about this because it, it, you know, you just, you understand something, but it took work. I mean, these books were, were boring. You had to remember the, uh, the name, all these different names, and you had to learn these names in Arabic and everything like that. And 
uh, you know, the the nine eleven truthers were giving you the easy way out. You know, it was like, oh, the the Bush did it. You know, Bush did it, and and uh, you know, oh, there's the holes in the official story. It's like, well, what's the official story? And they couldn't even get that right. So um, that's basically what RT is playing on. It's exactly as you said. It's a way for people to, to feel interesting and feel like they understand the world without putting in any of the work. And we're seeing the same thing repeated, just as how so many Americans after 9-11 were scared and didn't bother to try to understand what Salafi jihadism is. And they didn't take the time to, st- you know, they weren't reading Steve Cole's Ghost Wars to see how, uh, you know, the war in Afghanistan and, you know, how, how our policies evolved and how that led to everything that happened later. Um, you know, they just, they just pick the easy answers and there's different sets of easy answers. You know, there is the, the William Bloom, Noam Chomsky school about how everything is actually the fault of the U S and, um, and then again, like I said, it's that desire not to be a cringe normie and, what people don't understand is that, you know what, the world is very cringe normy. Um, you know, we, again, like in the West, uh, our, our American movies always have a villain with a tragic backstory. And in reality, most villains are just greedy. You know, they, they like doing what they want when they want to do it. Uh, they like that they can disappear people they don't like. Um, they like that they can have any woman in their society because they're powerful. And, and that's their only motive that, you know, Putin is not motivated when people talk about Putin. Uh, oh, he grew up poor in Leningrad and he had this this situation where he had to hunt rats in the apartment. He was so afraid of rats and he cornered a rat and it got so ferocious. This is a story that Putin tells. And uh, it's like, no, there's no tragic backstory. He was just trying to get ahead in the Soviet society, he joined the KGB, the KGB indoctrinated him and they're you know, paranoid worldview. And then he became a gangster on working under a, you know, gangster mayor of St. Petersburg. That's it. And, you know, the world, like I said, you know, you can say this is what the state department says or whatever, but here's the, here's the thing. Countries that are authoritarian shitholes are that way because of greedy, powerful people in those countries. It's not because they're trying to build a, you know, egalitarian utopia and America is besieging them and won't letting them. It, when you look at the ruling class in all of these countries, their kids are usually in the States. They're, they're spending money in yeah. Europe and they're in Paris. And, uh, you know, it, it, you could, we could be talking about Syria. We could be talking about Venezuela, Iran, whatever. Like they, they're, you know, they're going on coke binges in clubs with hookers. That's the reality of these countries, you know. And, and that's the thing is like reality is very cringe normy. The villains are one dimensional. It's just the way the world works. Yeah. And it's also worth saying, I think, that most of most of our governments, the really boring normy truth is that, for example, most civil servants and in fact, probably most politicians at least until sort of very recent times, were like earnest people just kind of trying to make a go of it, but often struggling due to their limitations, the complexity of the problems that face us, the complex political dynamics that our systems have evolved into. It's not some grand conspiracy. There's no Illuminati sort of pulling the strings and making things turn out the way they are. It's a lot of people who are trying. It's a lot of competing interests rubbing against each other and then at the end of it some sort of policy comes out yeah exactly i mean especially in dc you know everybody is about their all about their career here right and you have all these competing interests and more than anything it's all about your career your promotions getting that next gs level and that is the real driving factor in a lot of this. And this is why, again, the 9-11 conspiracy is so funny to me because there are so many people who would have to be involved in this. And we've had so many epic struggles in our political system. I mean, now you have people uh, supporting a major candidate who are flat out calling their opponents a secret pedophile cabal, right? So if anyone in that system, then we know that, you know, Trump had his very hardcore people in the FBI, in the CIA. If they had any evidence of like a 9-11 inside job, somebody would have dropped it at some point. Because here's the thing, 
again, competing self-interest, it's very cutthroat, and if you're the guy who exposes that the U.S. government did 9-11, this is, you know, you are they're going to take Andrew Jackson off the $20 bill and put your face on there, and you're going to have a monument in D.C. Um, and meanwhile, you know, Alex Jones has been ranting about this stuff for years, and no one's even tried to take a shot at him. So, uh, you know, it's... it's uh, uh, it, it, it's just ridiculous how how you know people sell this idea that there's this like cabal conspiring against uh, you know it's, it's conspiring against Russia to contain Russia and also it's trying to stop you from having a girlfriend and um, and the fact is like the world just doesn't work that way you are not the hero of your own story um, you're in a story you're in an ensemble cast that has seven billion people in it. And you want to, you know, you want to fight to be one of the, the better characters in that, let's say, if you must, you know, compare life to a movie. But that's the thing. Like I said, a lot of a lot of life is a lot more straightforward. I mean, I used to be into radical ideologies and stuff. And, you know, I used to I remember, um, you know, my opinion about Venezuela back in the time of Hugo Chavez. Uh, the idea was like, oh, Venezuela is having problems because the U.S. is, they don't like Chavez, they tried to do a coup, and he's just trying to help the poor and give you know, all this stuff. And then I actually met a Venezuelan, and I voiced some of these ideas. And it's funny, because I was still pretty arrogant at that time, but I was um, at least like smart enough to understand what I didn't know. I wasn't done in Krugering, right? And I said, like, well, isn't he just, you know, trying to help the poor people? And she explained to me, like, how she had a grandmother die due to lack of health care. This is not a person who is, you know, one of the Miami set, the elite. Uh, it, you know, it, a person like that would have just sent their relative to America to get health care. This is a person who basically could not make a living and could not be safe in, in Venezuela uh, because of the failures of that government. And that was kind of an early lesson in this, um, in, in you know, dispelling this idea that many Americans have that countries that are hostile to the U.S. and have problems, whether it's like censorship or poverty or something like that, uh, this idea that it's, you know, their, their leaders are actually good and they're popular. It's just that the U.S. is doing everything they can to sabotage them. And so they have to crack down and censor people. And, you know, they don't want to, but they have to. And, you know, they wouldn't have this poverty if it weren't for, you know, sanctions or something like that. In, in reality, it, no, it's, it's pretty simple. It's an, authoritar you know, it's an authoritarian government. The ruling class is basically taking the revenue from the state-owned enterprises and spending it on themselves. And, and that is the basic uh, thing that's going on there. You know, I think in the U.S., and this is especially a, a Chomsky thing, is that we confuse abstraction and uh, detail getting to the root causes and things. We confuse that for truth. Um, when reality, sometimes the, the truth is, is very simple. You know, it's like, yeah, the details and all the things, all the root factors, they are important and we should consider them, but we should never get to a point where we get so abstract that we are blaming the United States for what Russia is doing right now in Ukraine, for example. Yeah. To, to, to sort of take us back to, to Russia-Ukraine as you did there, something uh, I was thinking about when you were talking about how everyone wants to stand out and kind of be unique is the grifter ecosystem that has built up has built up, I think, in part because if you are a media commentator, if you are somebody with a YouTube channel who is saying normy things, you know, saying it is wrong for Russia to invade Ukraine, don't do that, you are lost in a sea of a million people because normal people say that kind of thing. But suddenly, if you are one of the small handful of people willing to just relentlessly push a contrarian view, then even if only sort of 4% of the population remotely agrees with you, you're only fighting for that 4% of the population with like five other grifters rather than the entire media ecosystem. 
So we have effectively, through the attention economy, created an incentive to be one of the people that is fact-resistant and anti-mainstream because that lets you be a pathetic fish in a small pond rather than a normal fish in the sea. You know, that is definitely true. If I, let's say I had no conscience and I wanted to grift people, uh, first of all, of my experience and upbringing, I would probably become a televangelist because it is it is very easy to make money off of God. And I know how to do it from experience in many charismatic churches and things like that. But if I lost my sense of conscience and dignity and um, empathy, and I just decided I want to be a YouTube grifter, what I would do is, and, and there are grifters who do this, like some of them do it kind of more organically, but some of them you can just tell are, are pander, just straight up pandering. Like there, there's not even any thought to it. They don't really have an established ideology. They just put their finger in the wind and and they go for it right and this is what i would do in every issue that comes up right i see you know people putting out ukraine flags putting out i stand with ukraine stuff what i would do is the opposite i would and, and what and the thing is now you know i need content and i'm lazy so what do i do I go to RT and Sputnik because they have stuff in English and I just regurgitate what's on there. And I do the same thing with vaccines, right? I see all the cringe normy stuff like, uh, you know, Stephen Colbert is having this cringy bit about getting a vaccine. Okay, vaccine bad. And there's tons of yep. websites to say it's bad. Um, it turned into a cultural issue, right? Like, uh, I see so many times this meme where like they, you know, they, they've made the, uh, the soy jack, give him purple hair, and he has the uh, trans flag and the BLM logo, and now they add Ukraine to it. So if you support Ukraine, you are the purple-haired, effeminate soy jack, right? I mean, even the, the concept of soy, this whole thing about soy and <laughs> feminizing men is a, uh, a grift. It was a grift to sell certain products, and it just got out of hand. And uh, so you know, this is what I would do. And I would just sit there. I'd just watch the news and I would look for the trends. I'd look for what people are putting in their Twitter bios and what they put, uh, the, the frames they put on Facebook. And I would just pick the opposite. And in a lot of cases, it's very easy to get content for that, uh, especially if it's a geopolitical thing because you just go straight to Russia to get it. And here's the thing. Once you start doing that, the Russian bot networks and troll networks are going to start boosting you for free. And they might even start to, if you, you know, once you get popular, they might start inviting you on to TV because they love, especially even for their own media, they love saying, oh, here's a Westerner who's speaking out against uh, the U.S. supporting Ukraine. And, you know, there's actually an, an influencer who is the perfect example of this, Jackson Hinkle, if you ever heard of this guy. He blocked me a long time ago because he knows he knows better than to try to fuck with me. This guy goes on debates all the time, but like he, he knows that I'm a guy who's actually been there and he knows that there's just no way that he can, and, and I won't debate him. Like I, I the, he is beneath debate. Like I, I, the same way I'm not gonna debate a, a six-year-old about the economy, I'm not going to debate this guy Hinkle and the reason why is because who the fuck is he right this is a guy who apparently tried to run for some uh he's like I think he's in his 20s he tried to run for some local office in California failed at that became a Bernie supporter he was doing influencing stuff and I'll be honest like the guy could have been a good he could have made a living from doing the whole influencer thing maybe doing like a fitness thing and selling supplements right but he decided to go to the dark side and he just started uh, regurgitating uh, Assad regime propaganda at first, uh, which of course you can easily get this from any number of uh, Russian sites or Russia linked sites. And all you gotta do is regurgitate that. And he was given an award by a nonprofit in the US that is believed to be uh, partially funded by the Syrian government. Um, so now he's an award winning journalist. It's called the Serena Shim Award. 
And um, then he, uh, you know, piggybacked off that, got, uh, you know, got involved with like Russian media and stuff like this. And uh, so you have something of a career. Uh, but it's a joke because it's so clear that, you know, the guy uh, started posing as a Marxist, but then he's talking about MAGA communism and, you know, patriotic American socialism. I mean, this is just, you know, national socialism, Nazism, right? But the thing is, like, when this guy first appeared trying to be a Marxist, I was like, you don't know jack shit about Marxism. I will fucking bury you in Marxist <laughs> theory. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'll start pulling out stuff like Paul Lafargue, the right to be lazy. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, he recently debated an Australian guy called uh, Drew Pavlo. I hope I'm getting his name right. And I remember seeing that coming up, and my instinct, my initial reaction was basically like, Drew, don't do it. Um, debating these guys, firstly, debating these guys elevates them and treats them like serious players, which they're not. And secondly, I think I I never agreed to any debates when I was on sort of TV, when I was on radio and stuff over on. I'm a trade commentator on Brexit stuff. I never agreed to debate anybody because my position was the medium of debate. Like if you and I were to have a debate right now, almost certainly the winner of the perceived winner of that debate would not be which of us has the more facts on their side, who's objectively right. It would basically just be is like, who's the better debater or who's more charismatic? If you are more charming than me or just louder than me or frankly are in charge of editing, you could win. And I'm like, I don't want, I'm pretty sure I have the truth on my side and I don't want to risk damaging the truth and damaging my side by losing a debate who, by somebody who's just like more experienced at debating than I am or more charismatic or whatever. Ultimately, I mean, I think in Drew's case, he's a young guy trying to make his name as an influencer. And I'm all kind of like, well, you know, I can't begrudge you that level of attention. You go do you. I think you did a respectable job. But yeah, that kind of grifter economy of just being, he is, he's changed his mind nine times to find the most lucrative contrarian position he can have, whether it is burning Syria Karl Marx or now Vladimir Putin and he settled on the one that frankly I think pays the most money yeah exactly and that's the thing about debate is that uh, I think there's this idea that like debate I think we see it as like uh you know, Socrates, these Greek philosophers, yeah. like sitting around and trying to determine what is truth. Uh, but that's not what it is. It's, you know, it's kind of like, um, have you ever heard of Greco-Roman wrestling, right? Like yeah. it, it doesn't come from Greece or Rome. It comes from like the 1830s. It was started by a, uh, I think it was a veteran of Napoleon's army. And he chose the name Greco-Roman because he wanted to associate it with the classical era, uh, well, you know, it was, it was just, it was popular at the time. And so he decided if I call it, uh, Greco Roman, it will, you know, sound interesting. And there was another term for it, it used to be called like flat hand wrestling or something. And, um, and, and so it's a situation where like we associate debate with these old Greek guys sitting around talking philosophy, but really what we've created is a spectator sport that does not get at truth. Um, because the thing is, some things really shouldn't be debated. Uh, drinking battery acid is unhealthy <laughs> for you, so you shouldn't do that. So I'm not going to debate that. I'm going to show you, um, at, at most, I will show you if you can find me someone who drank battery acid, they're probably dead or severely injured, and I can show you that, and that's it. That's the only source I'm going to give, right? And how sure are we about Michael Tracy? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That I, I would love to debate Michael Tracy <laughs> on the virtues of drinking battery acid because I could see he is probably the top contrarian out there. He is still, I say, he still seems to be arguing against U.S. intervention in the Second World War, which is yeah. uh, unconscionable and. Uh, for someone who is not an open neo-Nazi, uh, very high, it's highly unusual. <laughs> so, uh, but but you know, getting back to that issue of uh, debate, um, uh, yeah, there there are certainly like things that I, I would debate. But when it comes to uh, Russian claims about Ukraine or something like this, like no, so many of them are bullshit. And in the big picture, is just that Russia is an aggressor. They're waging an imperialist and now genocidal war. 
Uh, we're not going to have a debate about that unless you can show me evidence that these guys doing this stuff in Ukraine are actually the Bolivian army in disguise or someone, you know, China or something like that. Then no, Russia did it. And, um, and, and yeah, there's, there's simply no debate about uh, some of these topics. And there is a danger of sometimes lending credence to some of these people. And that's, again, that's why I'm not going to debate some of these people. I, mean, I might ask, I might say, okay, what do you want to debate exactly? And if it's something that is, uh, you know, something we can discuss without like, say, dismissing the basic human rights of a few million people, then sure, uh, you know, we can, we can debate policy like that. Um, you know, if we don't want to talk about like free market approaches versus public options and stuff like that. Yeah, sure. Okay. But when it comes to situations like this, uh, there's no real debate. And I'm certainly not going to debate them with a guy who does not speak Russian, has never set foot in either of these countries and just one day invented himself as this uh, Marxist with doing none of the reading and none of the research, uh, or, you know, even more insane to me is this, uh, Medea Benjamin, a code pink. She's published a book on the war in Ukraine. She has never been to Ukraine. She does not speak Russian. She does not speak Ukrainian. I don't think she's even been to Russia. Uh, how could you possibly write a book on that and, and present this and present yourself as someone who knows what they're talking about. If I wrote a book on India, I would be a complete idiot because I know very little about India apart from the very, you know, some historical things and the very basics. And that's it. I have friends who have lived there, you know, and, and uh, I would not tell them how things should go there or anything because that would be incredibly stupid. Um, and, and yet, you know, in the grifter economy, this is pretty much normal. The, the fact that, uh, what was her name? Like Donetsk Dievochka or something. The fact, that an, the fact that an American was able to pose consistently as a Eastern Ukrainian separatist warrior uh, and have a show that attracted sort of tens of thousands of views. It had everybody from the sort of MAGA slash anti- Ukraine war intervention ecosystem, all the really big names came on. And it's literally just this girl faking a Slavic accent. With yeah, not like even, an anime avatar thing. Not even a good one. You know, uh, first of all, yeah, I call her uh, <laughs> Donbass, uh, Donbass Dewushka. <laughs> Donbass Dewushka, yeah, because that's how she pronounces it. Uh, so it's like, like Dewu from uh, you know, the Korean company. So yeah, Donbass Dewushka, that, that is an amazing story. So her name was uh, Sarah Bills. Uh, she's not Russian, not Ukrainian, never been to either of those countries, does not speak the languages. She had some kind of staff helping her in her Telegram channel. And of course, she had many guests on her podcast. And I looked at those guests, and I know two of those people uh, live in Russia. Mark Slebeda and our good friend uh, Andrew Giant Head Karibko uh, are people who live in, they're Americans who live in Russia. Uh, Slebeda has been there since the early 2000s. I know that guy is absolutely fluent in Russia, Russian. Um, if he's not, I assume he is. If he's not, I would be floored. But I know that guy is such a Russophile, he should be at the very least conversant in Russian. Karibko, I believe, has been there since 2013. Um, I know somebody who went to college with that guy. So, uh, you know, th these are two people who were guests on the uh, Donbass Dewushka's show. And you got to ask yourself, did they not figure out that this was an American with no connection to Russia or Ukraine? If they didn't, well, you should never listen to these people because they, they've been living there and they just don't know jack shit, right? But, and if they did, you should not be listening to these people because they bought into a con. They, they had to know who this person was and that they're not Russian and that they're not from that part of the world. And yet they foisted that person on you and they told you that this person is telling you the truth that they don't want you to know. What does that tell you? If you keep believing, you know, you want to talk about feeling like a sheep that just swallows whatever information is thrown at you. What does it tell you when you have these people who presented this American woman as a alternatively Ukrainian or Russian woman and 
you know, not even convincingly, not convincingly <laughs> whatsoever. Like I, I, I guess if I really worked at it, I could pretend to be a Russian who, let's say, moved to the States really early. Or some of these people, they were brought as a child and they radiated back to Russia and were expats for a while. And I could probably pull that off pretty convincingly uh, just because, like, I, I did live like a decade there, yeah. right? So uh, th this woman, like, not even close. And, and like I said, she had these people that should have known better helping her. So were they just utterly incompetent and fooled by her? Then don't listen to them. Or were they lying to you and were they helping... Uh, push this deception on you. And if that's the case, then again, don't listen to them. Don't. Stop, you know? Yeah, th th there's no outcome here, really, that leads to you should listen to these clowns. This gets back to this point I like to make uh, when people talk about the mainstream media and everything. Like, look, I hate cable news. This is the reason I don't own a TV. <laughs> Cable news is crap. I don't care if it's Fox, CNN, MSNBC. It's nearly all commentary now. And, uh, you know, commentary in, in, that is opinion. It's not really analysis most of the time, right? And it's like that on, on every network. So, yeah, like watching CNN is not going to get you super informed about what's going on in Ukraine. It'll only get you the very basics. But what I tell people is, look, if I told you that eating at McDonald's is unhealthy, I would be right. But if someone comes along and says, well, you know what you should do? Don't go to a McDonald's. Go around back and eat stuff out of the dumpster. Okay. That's what these people are telling you when they tell you, listen to Don Bastyevushka or Russians Without Attitude or any number, uh, you know, Mint Press, RT. All, that's what they're doing is they're saying, go around back yeah. and eat out the dumpster, right? Mainstream media is bad. We should be listening to something good. This is something. Ego, this is good. And that chain of logic doesn't follow at all. Like, yes, CNN doesn't always get it right. And yes, CNN has ulterior mo profit motivations or is possibly influenced by the ideology of its founder. But to go from that and to go, okay, in that case, I will listen to a 24-year-old passing herself off as being from Donbass who has a overt profit motive and about whose motivations I know nothing, and who, by the way, doesn't have a research, like a proper research team, and there's no accountability. Like, that, it doesn't at all follow, even if you think that CNN, MSNBC, Fox are all lying to you, the idea that, oh, therefore, some chud with a YouTube channel is the one who is going to give me the unvarnished, pure truth with no ulterior motive, it's like a child's logic. Oh, absolutely. And another thing is that in mainstream media, usually, I mean, they will screw up, but usually somebody faces consequences for it. That's actually how you can judge whether a media source is worth listening to or not, is when they screw up, are there consequences for it? Because here's the thing, uh, you know, Donbass Dewushka, uh, she was exposed and then RT wrote an interview with her where she complained about being like doxxed or something like this. It was a bunch of nonsense, but it was like, uh, like she was pretending to be like she was conclusively proven to be posing as a Russian or a Ukrainian. If RT had any credibility, they would say, you deceived us. Get out of here. And then you know, RT, uh, I will tell you, Russia today fired Graham Phillips because he attempted to deceive them. That's how, that's how bad that guy was <laughs> that even RT was like, nah. Right. And so. Uh, you know, getting back to that, are there consequences for screwing up, right? And, and, and if you don't see those consequences, look at, uh, you know, these so-called military analysts that get trotted out all the time. You got the uh, the pedophile with multiple convictions, Scott Ritter. I just want to repeat that again. Scott Ritter, who has two convictions for sex crimes involving minors, and he had one uh, charge that was dropped, probably good lawyering. But I just want to put that out there, that that is Scott Ritter. Okay, and you will still see this guy trotted out constantly when you see the predictions he made about this war. First of all, the war wasn't going to happen. I mean, the big invasion wasn't going to happen. It was all Western propaganda. Then it happened, and he said that no, no Ukrainian's going to fight. Like, they, you don't understand modern warfare. No one's going to fight. Anyone who thinks about pulling a trigger is going to be utterly obliterated. Um, then he, you know, things weren't working out in Kiev, so he said uh, the Donbass cauldron is about to, to close, and... I will never forget his quote 
we're you're about to learn a lesson in Russian maneuver warfare. Like, really, guys? The people who are unable to operate more than 100 kilometers from their rail links, the guys whose, at the time he said it, their convoy was out of fuel on that road of death stretching towards Kiev. Like, and, and he's still, he's still out there. He's still being interviewed. He's still being quoted. No, there's no, um, you know, there's no consequences uh, for any of this. I mean, he said, um, well, actually, let me switch to another guy they often trot out. Uh, he's a former U.S. general, I believe, uh, McGregor. I, I can't remember his uh, full name right now. I believe it's McGregor is his surname. And uh, when he, uh, he made a prediction, I want to say it was last November, uh, he said in the coming weeks, I mean, he said a lot of things that turned out to be wrong, but the one that I directly encountered is he said in the coming weeks, Russia is going to launch an offensive and the Ukrainian military is just going to be utterly shattered in weeks, right? This is all supposed to happen. Uh, I was in the field in late November, early December. Um, I'm still here. I was out there in January and February as well. Still here. We weren't shattered. Um, you know, they, and they tried. They, they were counterattacking every day and everything, but they didn't get anywhere. Uh, he suffered massive losses. So where was this? Where is this happening? And these, these guys will never apologize. They'll never explain. They just keep doing it. And they keep getting invited on by the same people. So here's the thing. If you see Scott Ritter or you see this McGregor, you see these guys, look on YouTube. See how many interviews they have. Go back and look at their Twitter. Look what they were saying six months ago, nine months ago, or even just last month don't don't have the memory of a goldfish you know it's funny like we like i said we got to have a narrative we got to tell a better story and here's the thing here's my advice to anybody and i'm not an academic i didn't, like i said i didn't even go to college but i did understand one thing if you want to understand the world and you want to really know about something and you want to be interesting because you actually know what you're talking about it takes work. It takes time. Nobody's going to feed you this on YouTube. Okay, this is something that you know, I wanted to say about my own videos when I very stupidly decided to start doing some videos on history. Uh, I mean, it got the channel monetized, but it put a big burden on me, especially, you know, now what I have to do now. Uh, but the thing is that I try to tell people, like, do not expect a YouTube video to give you an actual understanding of history. If you want that, you need to read a lot of books on the same subject. Uh, oftentimes they are very boring and dry, but that is the only way to really approach an understanding, to really know something. It takes time. And anybody who is giving you these easy answers is lying to you. And like I said, in the case of Scott Ritter or any of these you know, analysts that you see coming on talking about how soon the Ukrainian army will be shattered. Well, let's see, how many times did this guy say that exact same thing <laughs> in the past nine months, right? And should we keep listening to this guy? You know, listening to guys who say, uh, I can't remember exactly who it was, but we mentioned him earlier that someone said, uh, well, you don't know what to say. It looks like the entire Ukrainian army just shattered on impact. He was saying this literally a few hours into the full-scale invasion. How does it look today? Would you listen to that guy after something like that? No. And, that, and that's the thing. is the, the narrative we have to say is stop being a sucker, Okay. They want to say that if you don't believe their bullshit, you're a sheep who just listens to whatever your government or mainstream media tells you. No, no, no. They're trying to do that to you. They want to make you the gullible sheep that'll swallow what they say. And what you need to do is uh, understand that if you want to know, if you want to understand what's going on, you need to do work. You, you don't go to the mainstream media and just watch whatever's on CNN or you read the headlines, like do some actual research. Or there's an alternative. You could say, I don't have an opinion on that because I really haven't done enough of my homework and just leave it at that. And most people will respect you for that because it's better than just being a blowhard and, and opining about things you know nothing about. Hey, that's my business model. You take that back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that part one of my interview with James Spaghetti Kozak. In part two, James debunked one trope after another and attacked some of the most infuriating comments we read online about Ukraine. To support James in all of his endeavors when he's not fighting for Ukraine, do check out his YouTube channel. You can find it by searching Spaghetti Kozak on YouTube or just by clicking the links at the bottom of this podcast. 
He does video game reviews, really insightful history videos, and of course commentary on what he's doing over there in Ukraine. Do support him and help him out.